Okay, I'm getting the nod. So, hello everyone. Welcome to Brattleboro Museum and Art Center. Um, some very familiar faces. My name is Sarah Freeman. I am the director of exhibitions. Is everybody here who's okay? All right. Um, so, this talk is being recorded and live streamed. So, um, it's going to be available for posterity, which is very exciting. And I'm really excited to have Judith Clausen here tonight. She is the artist that decomposed. I'm introduce Judith and say a couple of things about how wonderful she is, and then ask her some questions. And then I hope you all will have some questions too. And of course, a chance to see the exhibit. Seen it all, visit it, and um, so you can be the proud owner of some earthworm earrings or a blanket of brooch or any number of things. Um, and Judith is an artist living in Somerville, Massachusetts, and with a love for small, intricate, and overlooked things. She received her degree in studio art from Wesleyan University after constructing her thesis primarily out of insects. Her experience of invisible disability and chronic pain play an integral role in how she views the world and creates art. Her work has been featured in Harper's Magazine, Reader's Digest, The Huffington Post, and NPR, and has been exhibited in venues internationally. Um, and we're thrilled to have her in her exhibit here through March 4th. And also tomorrow, Judith is leading a um, moth mending workshop here at the museum at 2 p.m. So if you have anything that has a hole in it that you need mended, um, you should bring it by. So my first question, which I think I may have asked you when we first met, was how did you discover this? Um, so this is actually sort of a coming home for me with materials. I started out as a, a kid. I loved art. Um, I did all kinds of art that I could every chance I got. I wasn't actually, I mean, you're not supposed to say this, but someone who's taught art, you know, it feels wrong, but I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> but in the, in the sense that it was frustrating because mine didn't listen to me. Um, you know, Things in the world, like I tried to grease them, and I, I was just not super pretty cool with them. Um, and I was lucky enough that you know, I was in public school, we did actually film, um, but it was once a year. Once a year, we had a ceramic clay project, and it was the most exciting thing because clay. The world. That listened um, at some point at a, a birthday party in about fifth or sixth grade. Um, someone's parents picked up this exciting new material that, that kids were using, polymer clay, mm -hmm. and they just sort of put a bunch of polymer clay in front of us and we had time to play with it. And it was like the world just opened up because this was this was clay just three dimensions. It listened, and you could do it at home. You could do it all the time, I mean, depending on how much your parents are going to get for you. <laughs> but, but it was suddenly accessible in this way that it really hadn't been before. Um, and that changed everything. I mean, it, it, it meant that that I really, that was the moment that I thought, I just wanted to do this forever. I, I want to be an artist. I want to just always be making things like this. And um, and I continued to work with people and play through high school, but I also, um, there was a, a strong ceramics program in my high school, and so I sort of turned to that as being my more serious art. And it was a material that was taken much more seriously, though we had to fight for that for a long time, too. Um, and then I went to college, and I accidentally went to a college for kind of film, which I've looked to a lot of schools, and uh, everything went a little 
Thanks, Beth. Um, so I ended up in college and suddenly I couldn't use the material that prompted me to be my home in art. And um, I floundered a lot. I did a lot of sort of grasping around trying to figure out what to do because at the time, this this first home of a pollen play didn't feel like an option because this was a kid's toy. People were like, you know, that would be like, like you made your art with crayons, you know, no one was going to take that seriously. And, and so I did a lot of sort of just trying to look around and see what was there and working with different things. And that's actually what kind of brought me to insects, which is a recurring theme. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I've always really been interested in insects and thought that they were beautiful and interesting. Um, and, but that was the first time I used them as an art material. And so near the end of college, that became my focus. And I worked with bugs. Um, people have a really strong reaction to bugs. <laughs> so that was interesting as someone who's uh, often in many ways very non confrontational in my personal life, but my art became something that by virtue of its material was confrontational, even though I, I thought, well, you know, the bugs are interesting, it's beautiful, but there were a lot of strong feelings. Um, so uh, I worked with, with bugs for a while, um, and that was that is something that obviously topically is still alive in my art. Um, and then turned to some other non-traditional materials. I worked with packaged food for a while. Um, I was lucky enough, I think, to, uh, to grow up in a household where I wasn't told I could play with my food. I was told that I could play with it as long as I ate it afterwards, which I think was really important. <laughs> so um, I did a lot of sculpting with my food. <laughs> I just didn't mix things that didn't taste good together. So, you know, it had to look good and taste good. <laughs> um, uh, and I worked in medical ephemera. And, um, and at that point, I uh, I had a really bad handful of years with my chronic health condition, which I have chronic migraine, which is really a, it's a full body disease. And it's something that really, uh, really knock you out. And so I had a number of years where I just didn't have the energy to make it the way that I had been, and that was also very that contributed to a lot of depression because I think there's a lot of people who who make poor artists or who have or musicians or or create in any way. You have this itch under your skin. You, you need to be making things, and it really was uh, a bad cycle of feeling too bad to to be able to make anything, but then having not made anything things become this terrible feeling at the beginning. And that, that I think when people are experimenting with things and somehow it felt like less pressure to, to be serious and, and more freedom to play with things. And I think that kind of gave me the freedom to go back to this original material that I, I'd always worked with on the side. Um, I mean, I make sculptures as presents for friends and family. And, um, but I, I still have this idea that you, know, you can't you can't do that as serious art capital letters of course you're serious. Um, and the world stopped playing by any rules, so then it was sort of a feeling of like you know. Um, and it was amazing to to come home to this material and then I put this was something that I'm both so comfortable with and that there's so much left to learn and there's so much you can do with and that. I I have been frustrated over all the different things that weren't taken seriously in the arts world, in, in all different worlds and different venues because of a variety of reasons that are really rubbish. And, um, and I finally realized that this was I had just sort of internalized this one, that this wasn't this wasn't serious. And I think it, I mean, it's a it's a gatekeeping issue in a lot of ways. This is something that makes sculpture, which can be hugely inaccessible to, to produce, um, because so much so many of the materials that are taken seriously in sculpture take an enormous amount of infrastructure, they take money, they take space, um, and it makes it something that is not dependent on having those resources. It's dependent on having interest and passion, and so I. I now move to a soapbox about that yeah, one. That one. Um, I 
you know, fiber it's had to fight for a long time, ceramics had to fight for a long time. Oh, many of these things are also things that were traditionally mostly done by women. Um, and if, if you look at the uh, the adults in the polymer clay sort of sphere, uh, particularly people who are breeding free educational materials hmm. uh, within it, it's mostly women. Uh, and so it, to me, I feel like it ties into the same struggle for getting to be taken seriously, um, no matter what material it has to do with how you use it and how you think about it. Um, so. That's why I'll step down to the soapbox. Oh, no. <laughs> Open the box. soap sack. <laughs> um, uh, but really, one of the things that's amazing to me about it as a material is, in addition to its accessibility, it's incredibly versatile. And there are so many things you can do, and I'm still learning and still experimenting, and that's just very exciting. And how, I'm really curious about like, how you combine the materials with polymer clay. Like, how is it? You just must be experimenting with all the time. That is one of the really great things about it is that you can mix it with so many things. And part of that is that it's it's baking temperature. So you put a film where it right, you set most things on fire. When you use ceramics, there are only a few different materials when you put a film, not, not expecting them to disintegrate. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're cooking something at this low a temperature, you can cook almost anything other than plastic. So you can put any kind of fibers that can be paper, there can be cloth. All sorts of different materials can be mixed in um, or attached or you know just built into it in various ways, which opens up a huge number of avenues. Um, in one of the other in the, the ant piece that has breadcrumbs, the the breadcrumbs, there are three different flavors. Actually, I'm sorry, two, only two of the flavors made it onto the final piece, but somewhere in the slides there are all three flavors of breadcrumb. Um, but the, the sort of the sourdough, as I see it. Uh, which, oh, here, there we go. There is a sourdough. Thank you. <laughs> um, a sourdough of breadcrumb uh, is a mixture of a translucent clay and mustard powder. Um, so a little bit of actual edible yeah. material in there, but you know, not so edible once it's done. Uh, but it gives that the graininess and that really the, the subtle texture that you get in the grain of a of a bread. So another big. That you can make anything with <laughs> it. Yeah, really opens up a lot. And so, can you talk a little bit about how the particular work in the decomposed came together? Because there's a very specific theme that's tying everything together. Absolutely. Um, so, this I think also kind of relates back to loving in some ways, in that they are something that people, a lot of people find really gross or upsetting or scary. Um, and the mold piece that was up a few minutes ago, I think that was one of, that was the first piece in this series. Um, and that was, I think, really inspired by growing up. My, my mom was a science teacher. And um, and when things would go bad in the they inevitably did because in our household, any amount of food got kept in a container. You don't throw away the food until it goes moldy. You put the two bites in a container and you put it in the fridge. But once it's moldy, it's okay. <laughs> Um, but it meant that we, you know, not infrequently had things go moldy in the fridge. But when if my mom was cleaning out the refrigerator and she found something that had gone moldy before she threw it away, she called me over to look at it. Mm -hmm. As a like, look at this really interesting thing that's happened. Like it grew this, it's grown this mold. This is like a cool other uh, process that has taken place. And I think that was also A long time later. So the mold is pretty beautiful and sometimes really adorable. It's fuzzy. We usually think of fuzzy things as cute. I mean, sometimes the mold is really cute. Um, and you have these really uh, delicate growths and different interesting colors, and different colors of mold have different textures that make you that you find in different ways, and it's fascinating and beautiful. And also, it's a thing that's really great. Um, and making that piece is what led to the entire series because. I started thinking about all of these other things in everyday life where that feel ruined to us, but that have some other element of life or creation or something that has happened that has that has positives, that has value. Um, mm -hmm. And that I feel like resonated with me a lot because of 
struggling for a very long time with not not living the life I thought I was going to have. Because my although I've had migraines since I was a kid, they really didn't become a chronic and debilitating thing until I was near the end of college. But I'd always been very academically minded. I was getting into a good school, having a good career, and around me, my peers started to want to function. And I spent a really long time and a lot of energy being myself about that and feeling like, well, everything happens now because this is what I thought a good life was going to look like. And my life doesn't look like that. And so it's just this is sort of it's it's gone all the yeah. way. It's um and it took a lot of years and a lot of therapy um <laughs> to to come to a place where I realized that my life didn't look anything like what I thought it was going to look, what I hoped it was going to be, but I have a life that makes me happy. And that even if there are parts of it that are hard and parts of it that you know I still think, well, I wonder what would have happened if I had had a different path to travel. But but there's a lot of beauty there and a lot of joy, and I'm I'm letting myself be happy with my life, which I think is a thing I didn't allow myself to do for a long time. So that that also connected to this idea of looking at something that could be ruined, but also have another way of looking at it. And so did the multi <laughs> did the multi bread kind of once you had made that, what was like what came next? Did you think, okay, wow, I'm gonna make it an entire body of work that's gonna, you know, slice <laughs> by piece by piece? Like how did that I mean, I think I kind of, in the beginning, I drift to carefully into it because there have been this, this many year expanse of just creative luck and making that and feeling like, it, you know, I couldn't make something that was going anywhere. And so this felt really exciting, but I also was doing a little bit like, uh, yeah, it's just don't get too excited. Right. Because, you know, because my head might do something. My, 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 It might just sort of turn to it does sometimes in some pictures. And so a lot more with this. Um, it also coincided with that I had pretty recently started taking a, a new medication that will make me take a pretty, pretty I, I started here. That combined with way fewer resources. Um, but as I started to, to get into it, so I feel like it's like a little anticlimactic what the next piece was because the next piece was the holy heat bread. <laughs> okay, so there and there. Okay, there you go. But um, has it was so much the oats and the, the seeds. Um, is really uh, very satisfying to do. Um, so after the two moldy bread pieces, which I'm doing, um, this, the sprouted potato, I think, was the, the beginning of opening it up. Um, and it's sort of taking on some momentum. I Oh, here's the three different flavors of uh, <laughs> flavors are all just keep it real slightly. <laughs> These are the pala down here is the one that didn't actually make it into the final piece, but I think I'm gonna call my box. So, um, at what point did you set yourself the challenge of making every element by hand? That is a really good question. Um I, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I know that everything I've made up until that point, it, it had managed to stay in that rule. But I'm not totally positive at what point I said, no, that, that's how it wants to go. And I, I know that by the time I got to the possible, it was solidly in place because the one I remember is reaching for the possible sticker on my plate. 
Wait, no, I'm not allowed to do that. But it was certainly before that, since that was all here in peace. But that was it was fun. It was a fun way of giving myself a rule that challenged me to to do things I hadn't done before because I have really loved working like really multimedia um, and sometimes using bringing things in as themselves. You know, it's a raw fan piece. It was a real rock. And there's something very pleasing about the textural interactions and things like that. But this was something where I wanted to give myself more of a challenge and see what I could do and sort of push that, see if I could push my abilities in certain ways um, and that material. It seems interesting to me that like this making all of these things, I imagine it takes a really huge amount of concentration and kind of physical discomfort. And I think that's really interesting because you know you're a person who has a lot of the time, you know, not feeling great. It's true. Um, it has been so common that before, occasionally by my great parent spouse, who worries about me. Um, it, it's a pretty uh, physically draining yeah. stance toward them, very right? small yeah. things for many hours. I've tried to get better about reminding myself to take breaks and uh, specifically focus on things at different distances because I focus mm -hmm. on things so close to me that I will then spend about an hour not being able to focus my yeah. eyes on anything, um, which is not great, also because it mimics it. Of my friends, you know, right? Focus on my so, yeah. um, so I am, as I, as I get older, trying to be better about actually remembering that I, there are ways I can take care of my body. But also, sometimes it's just really painful, and it I, it's worth it to me for for scratching that itch. Yeah. And so, what, like, aside from the, the physical discomfort um, or challenges, what, like, what's Hard about making this kind of work and what's easy. What's what are the good parts and what are the, the challenging parts? Well, I feel like those are two different questions. Yeah, because the challenging part isn't always bad. <laughs> no, <it's> true. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, I think one of the difficult parts is when trying new things is difficult. And I feel, although it's a very comfortable medium, there have been a lot of things within this series where I've done things that were certainly very new to me. For mm -hmm. even the ants, which there's a series of the ants in progress that I'm yeah. going through right now. Um, so it's in different stages, like marching along the ruler. <laughs> but these were um, one of the last pieces that I, or one of the, the, the most recent pieces that I've been in the series. Because earlier I had, I had been doing insects and a lot of insects, but there was a certain scale which I thought this is this is as small as I can go. There are lots of insects that I would love to do within this theme, but I can't do that. They're too small. And one of the things I wanted to do was ants. And um, but I thought, well, that's crazy. I can't do that. Near the beginning, when I was thinking about sort of what would this theme. And so I had been working on it, but the series for about a year and a half at that point in my life. I'm working smaller and smaller and getting smaller and smaller with the details. And I thought, you know what? It's still crazy, but I'm going to try it. I'm going to yeah. let myself try it because it seems a little less crazy now. But certainly, that sort of trying something that feels like I'm going to fail at it. I mean, that's always scary yeah. for everyone. Um, the most exciting part, or the, the most fun part, is when it works. Yeah. <laughs> when you yeah. try something, you're like, well, this is definitely going to fail. And, it actually doesn't fail because that feels very invigorating. And so is it like, is it success? What is, when is it really successful? It's like, is success when something looks exactly like it, it looks in real life? Because that's what happens like when I every order. Did she make the ruler? So Sarah gave actually successful background. Sarah came. Used to you was it during um, when when things were yeah. so pretty, pretty bad uh, pandemic wise and our our household was still a masks on completely all the time household if there was anyone mm -hmm. over and I I wanted to be able to offer hospitality and I thought spent a lot of time thinking about this before Sarah came I thought well there are things food and beverages aren't just for like because you're thirsty or hungry but also they sort of social. A, a social use. They give you something to do with your hands. You can, like, you know, it's yeah. 
feel like they're important for meeting people and kind of potentially awkward situations. And so I decided to sculpt a cup of tea and a plate of jam gum right with the use, which was the jam. <laughs> the process I used was the jam. <laughs> then came into the ant piece. It's the same jam oh, process. Oh, cool. um, good. I would say from the same jar of raspberry uh, <laughs> <laughs> jam. Um, and and at the time I thought like, well, either this will go over well. <laughs> and, and Sarah, who I never ever would be amused or totally get out of my mind. <laughs> but, sure. Um, <laughs> or <laughs> yeah. Of course. Um, so <laughs> it was um I think the fact that that went over okay. um was part of feeling like oh this is someone I could uh, trust really get along with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes. Um so I think okay, so you asked about so I got really derailed by this one spelled with cookies. Um I get derailed by all the cookies. It's just a cookie thing. Um so so I think in this is different in different parts, but in different parts, like the real thing is possible. Some of it also has to do with competition. So it's, you know, there was the ants piece actually, again, just to just keep on the ants. Um, that piece also had a whole process after making, you know, after I made the ants, and I thought, wow, okay, I made the ants, this is really exciting. Okay, now we have to make the whole scene that the ants go in, which actually making the, the formatic pattern learning a whole thing process that was really fascinating and interesting and exhausting it's all more sanding than I've ever done before. Um, but even once I had all of the individual pieces, I had a slab of formica and I had formica and I had a thing of flavors of crumbs and I had ants and I had a love of jam and a, a bread tag. And I thought, well, I should put these all together now in a way that Visually makes sense, and everything doesn't just lose itself. Yeah. Um, so that was sort of a two part challenge on that one. Where it was look as much as possible like your life, and then what artistically <laughs> arrange the things? Well, I mean, I think the, the barnacles, because you how many barnacles? For this list of eight, but for installing on the yeah. pedestal, I think it gets two hundred. Yeah. I mean, it's two hundred particles, which box? Yeah, did not look like two hundred particles. If I had to estimate, it would be like maybe fifty. Oh. They did not take up very much space. For me. Yeah. I was on a particle regiment. Yeah, ten a week. Oh. I was like, I signed ten a week particle. Many months leading up to the show. And it's a question that I know a lot of people ask artists is like, how do you know when something's done? Because you eat up? Yeah. Because um, sure. I can just keep at it, I can just continue to barnacle out yeah. the entire room is covered with barnacles. Um, but I would go insane. So I think actually mm -hmm. some of them it's done when I don't think my mental health can take to it yeah. anymore of it. Um, some pieces just sort of feel like that's like the potato, I think. Certain number of sprouts, certain number of kind of felt more contained. Mm -hmm. um, particles can go forever. Other things are sort of in between. Mm -hmm. But what it's based on feeling white. It's breath this based right. on and sometimes it's just mental health. Yeah. I can imagine it's really kind of Excruciating <laughs> sometimes in a great way, but yeah. I mean, sometimes I'll be a short Yeah, it's <laughs> And is, it also seems like the different work that I've seen of yours feels like it was very intentionally a body of work and not like um, a person who was kind of working and things sort of, you know. Come together, you see common themes. It's more like, oh, I'm intentionally setting out to do you know, this particular thing. Is that how you measure your work? Yeah, I think that's really how I'm most comfortable working. Mm -hmm. um, I like having a theme and really digging into that theme and, and feeling like I'm trying to go down different avenues with it mm -hmm. and, and see what I can get from it so that ends up creating mm -hmm. a body of work. And, and 
I like creating a hole that's made up of other holes as well. So mm -hmm. even if I fit into one piece, if it's not part of a yeah, a, a group, it, it feels like a much smaller idea. Mm -hmm. And is there are there things that if there were no like you know no no obstacles, no like physical health obstacles, are there things that you like work that you'd like to make? That's a really interesting question, but I don't know if I have a very interesting answer for it. Um, it can be no. <laughs> um, I think the things that end up at this point um, sort of dictating the areas or the materials that I put are less health based and more other things. Mm -hmm. um, I am more interested in small pieces on large scale, but also I don't have the the basis in sort of structure to be able to make something that has structural integrity. A lot of the tools involved in those things are just, they're problematic for me to use. But even if I yeah. could use the tools, I still wouldn't have the background or the yeah. um it's just I don't know. My heart my heart is in tiny things. Um, and are you working on several pieces at a time or are you really just kind of I need to be focused. I occasionally will do things where once one thing has a reason why it has to be on the boss. Yeah. Because then I can't not work on a thing because yeah. I'll go a little crazy. But um but other than that, I really like to, to work on one thing, and that's what's in my brain. That's just sort of what's what's in there all the time you can chew it off until it's done. What do you do when you like hit a wall or something? Where does something um honestly sometimes get very depressed. Yeah. Um, but I mean it depends on like, how big a wall and how, yeah. you know if it's an individual sure. thing, if it's you know one piece of something, it'll be frustrating and I will have a day where I'm in a bad mood and I think like, oh everything's terrible. But yeah. um you know, not to generalize drastically based on a very small thing, right. but just everything is terrible. And um but with that I can more often at least after a day or two redirect and try to think okay like let's let's try something else let's right. try to work on something unrelated maybe go back to that what feels less like it's I try yeah. um, but occasionally there'll be a piece that it just Usually it's a couple of dries and a couple of like getting progressively more depressed about it. And I think like, you know, walking away is probably the best idea for everyone in this situation. So this is the one that I kind of saw and I was like, what's happening? This is incredible. And then when I actually saw it in person and was told that the popsicle stick was fabricated and not a popsicle stick, it blew my mind because of that. Where the the popsicle has melted and and stained the popsicle stick, I was I could almost smell that popsicle stick smell, and I was con just convinced that it was that was amazing. That was kind of the one that really tipped the scale. I was so glad that you had it, that visceral reaction to that because that's something I really hoped for with with a lot of things, but especially in this piece to me. It felt like I want people to. I always ask people what flavor it is because mm -hmm. I know what flavor it is to me, yeah. but I don't think there's a right answer for this one. But I like that. I, I hope that people can taste a memory when they see it. Maybe not of the taste of yellow jackets, but I'm not right. going to judge. <laughs> <laughs> so I yeah, that, the visceral response to this one I think yeah. that makes me very happy. And certainly making the possible stick for this was one of my like where you're like, oh right, okay, I have to actually figure out how to fabricate this, but it was. It was one of the most satisfying things to do. I really, because I went from thinking having just no yeah. idea about it, because I hadn't usually I start thinking about a piece and I start thinking in my head about how I'm going to do it, and I hadn't thought until I started making the piece and reached for possible stick. I just hadn't, wow. it hadn't clicked that that wasn't how this was going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, mm. Yeah, wow, sorry. <laughs> I was just still focused. And something else that I'm wondering if you had ever done before 
have you made pigeon droppings <laughs> I, I have not made pigeon droppings really? until <laughs> you did it so, so well. Thank you. I'm glad it's one of the pigeon droppings. <laughs> um, I haven't made them any until preparing for the show when that was something I wanted to do. And so I did some practice ones and yeah. like experimenting with different things and then some research about pigeon droppings. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. So that's some interesting things. Um, and but yeah, this was you know, so I came. If you saw me that day, or I came in with my like little sculpted bits and yeah. my acrylic paint, mixing together, and I like, threw them off. Very <laughs> trying to make things look like they're not done. Yes. yes. And I kind of wonder how you do that, like how you how you effectively randomize. Because that's really hard. Humans are really bad yeah. at random, um, which is something I'm very aware of. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, it was just sort of I, I sat in the, I sat, I like to sat down on the floor in the, in the gallery, and I thought, okay, if I were a pigeon in this space, I had, like I've been in this room for like I don't know. It's like five hours. I'm trying to think, like, how long has the pigeon been in here? <laughs> All right. Where would it, where would it land? Like, it's mostly yeah. hanging out in that corner. So, probably, you know, there's that, like, not going to wall. It's yeah. probably, but there's the side of the um, the wall that's made a piece there. Like, well, it's definitely going to land up there. It's definitely going to perch up there. So, that's going to direct some of this. And, like, what are some other places it might hang out? Um, and then I act random to come in. <laughs> I want to ask for a different set of eyes. It's easier to randomize something. It's not just all going to be the same brain. Yeah. All right. Where where else do you think the pigeon would have would have relieved itself in this room? And something that I also really enjoyed when I flew there with people is that different people kind of make pieces of the show because you know say some like this and that's what sort of or you know, pulling up dandelions and seeing how, how, how hard that is to do. Um, and I wonder if there, like, if any of the pieces that you've made are kind of connected to specific memories. I know the ants are. Yes. <laughs> but if there are any other ones that kind of um, relate to that. So, interestingly, the popsicle one is sort of. I, I changed my experience there aesthetically, mm. but the experience of having um, being sort of swarmed by yellow jackets. Um, um, the it sounds right. I'm just things that you are eating. <laughs> yeah. Um, the strongest memory that I have for that is actually that. Uh, so I. I live one state over in Massachusetts, and um, we go apple picking every uh, every fall. And the place where we go apple picking, there's you know, we go over to the spot where there's the cider donuts and the cider afterwards, because the best part of apple picking is the cider donuts. Mm -hmm. And um, but the picnic tables where you sit there, always. I mean, because everyone's dropped little bits of donut and things filled bits of cider, and it's sticky and it's covered in sugar and there are already a ton of yellow jackets there because they also love the rotting apples and they are just everywhere that they are. They want to drink your cider. <laughs> yeah. So I think my very strong, at least more recent memories of that are, are cider based. But I also, as a kid, it was the trash cans where we'd throw away the wrappers from our ice cream mm -hmm. and popsicles oh. in like the schoolyard and, and the playground. Um, those were what we always had, like near the end of the year. And during the summer, there are always yellow jackets swarming all over there. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody hear that? Any questions for Judith? Or any from our people who are looking up? Okay. Do you use just your eye? Are you young enough, so young still, <laughs> that you use only your eyes, or, or do you use magnifying glasses? This is actually one where the uh, medical issue comes into play, which is mm -hmm. that I. I use magnifying devices. They trigger, they trigger my migraines almost immediately. Um, so when I when I was newly graduated from college, um, a long time ago at this point, and I worked really small. My parents said, "You're going to ruin your eyes," and they got me this very nice lighted magnifier on a goose neck. It's really quite lovely. 
and I tried to use it, and I was and I noticed it's like you can't do it with any sort of magnifying device, just, mm. just as this. Um, so I gave it to a friend who gets DVD miniatures, and I <laughs> and I just go with my eyes, and I'm just really humble. So. <laughs> Yeah, is, is light a trigger also because you're doing such fine work? I wanted to give it more light by painting on the canvas. So, so um, light can be absolutely. Um, for me, I'm lucky in that um, only certain types of light are triggered. So, if I don't already have a binary, um, certain very bright light, flashing light, mm. um, or, or or flickering certain LEDs, not like flickering them, um, or uh, the sun. In face with all of its capacities. Um, so that's the reason why that worked well for me. I just didn't leave um, But I am not like I'm very lucky. This is a little bit more than the end of the time where you can be a magnified and produce lights as if you just so I mean, it looks very difficult anyway, <laughs> but make it even worse. Certainly, and I think I would at least if my mother's belief uh, about light yeah. is, is to be believed, I would ruin my eyes by now. Yeah. I can't yeah. use the light. I'm curious about this cicada and how you set that up and like sort of what your thinking was behind that. So for me, that yeah, was actually um, a little bit of a new step by uh, in creating something. Like that, uh, which is an exciting thing to be able to do. The cicadas for me are something that I actually, not this past 17 year group, because that was a little bit too far away, but the 17 year group before that um, was mostly in front of Cape Cod, and I had my one friend. <laughs> Rented a car and drove to, the, uh, to try to experience it. Like a cicada <laughs> chaser, right? Trying to chase down the cicada fruit. Um, but people who live with where they have very large roots every year, I've heard a lot come about the combination of just the deafening noise all the time. You know what I mean? Um, but it just being this sort of Sound that you feel because it's everywhere, um, and and the mass of them, um, and just that they're everywhere. And cicadas, one of the things that are interesting about me is that if people find them very intimidating, they're the alien looking and they're big junk bugs. So, um, but they are completely harmless um, mm -hmm. to the point that they have no natural defense mechanism other than numbers. Sheer numbers are their defense mechanism. The idea is, you know, a certain number of them will get squashed or eaten, but right. enough of them will breathe that it's just going to keep going. So, and I find it interesting. Um, I wanted to focus on one cicada because the because he didn't get his whole thing was just the amount, the, the sound of giving the idea of it, the many, but really getting to focus on the one. Yes. Um, I'm not sure how that phrase what I'm going to say, so I'll, I'll work around it. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm just completely fascinated with your combinations of materials in order to get what you want something to look like and, and the experimentation. And, and I'm Nothing is off and and the wonderful and the uh, and I also am curious about um, you know you talk about doing research into these different insects and you might have covered this so. I should have worn my hearing aids and research and learning more about about what you're doing. I mean, and, you know, the dandelion that you have. I mean, I walk in here and I just swooned. You know, it's just, you know, and, and to look at the the uh, the information about it 
you know, it's like, oh, yes, okay. That tells me a lot more that I'm also able to experience it. And I'm seeing, so I'm being educated and seeing this beautiful thing that you've made. So um, I don't know if there's anything in there you want to talk about. Um, I guess I'll start by saying that um, it's, it's very gratifying the way you describe being able to experience and, and get something from it without reading um, the extra information and getting more information from that because that's my goal with my own art and any kind of art statement is always that I want people to be able to, if, if they didn't read anything mm -hmm. that I wrote, to be able to get something from the work and then that that should always be additive. Then there's maybe something extra, hopefully, that comes from that, but it should be able to just be experienced on its own. Um, so yeah. <laughs> I'm very happy about that. Um, the research, I really take after my dad. My dad always has, at any given time, he has something that he's really passionate about. They can, it can last for like two years, it can last for 10 years, different things over the course of his life. But whenever he gets really passionate about something, he goes down the rabbit hole <laughs> and he will study. He'll just read all the things, he'll study everything, he'll join all the groups. It's just, and I, I do really take after him in that where like I get excited about something. Like that. Okay, so let's find out all the things about it. I'm gonna, gonna read the books, gonna talk to people, I'm gonna watch the things. I um so I don't know that it's um like that. See, I actually have a lot of uh nominal aphasia and brain fog from neurological stuff. So talking around an idea is I'm very familiar with. I feel like it's most of my communication. Um, I'm going to talk around this one now because I'm struggling a little bit with my words. Um, I can't remember what order you asked. You asked about an order in terms of information and making something. And I think that often the idea comes from having a little bit of information and then I get excited about making something and being excited to make it gets me excited to research it. And then I research it and I learn more about it and that makes me more excited to make it. So it's sort of a self feeding cycle. I love that. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Oh, wait, there's another. Has any of your art been used in any commercial? <laughs> Sorry, I'm saying that. I'm, gonna, I'm wording this carefully because of an NBA. There are a few works that I made that are that were used as set decor in an up it's as yet I was wording I'm supposed to use them. Yeah, as yet to be released Marvel film. Wow. Um, I I have no idea if anything can come of it will make the final cut in any way. No idea. Um so sorry. Can you tell us what it is? No. 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 no.